Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my weekly entertainment wrap-up for April 14th through 20th. This week I read three books, I watched three shows, and I listened to two books. Is that accurate? Good. Because I guessed. The books I physically read this week were for Pride-a-thon, although I did swap something out and there's something from my TBR that I haven't quite finished. I've got about 50 pages left, so it will be on my next wrap-up. The first book I read this week was Summer of Salt by Katrina Leno. This is a contemporary with magical realism elements to it that takes place on a small island on what I imagine is the east coast of the United States, but I don't think it's actually said explicitly. I even tried to google this location and didn't really find it, so it might be a fictional place. We're gonna go with it. This book concerns twin girls who have just graduated high school and at the end of the summer will be going away to college. All of the women in their family have some sort of magical ability, except for our protagonist. Her powers have not shown up yet. This book has a queer romance, which we all know I'm here for. It also has witchy elements, which I know a few of you definitely enjoy. I've seen people rave about this, and for me, this one was okay. I enjoyed it. Some of the magical realism threw me off, especially when it was happening when normal humans were around, because obviously they would look at it and be like, that's not a thing that should happen, but it's fine. Regardless of me not getting on with those technical aspects of the book, I did end up enjoying it, even though I saw a lot of the things coming. Next I moved on to I Am Jay by Chris Beam. This is a trans coming of age story in which the main character, Jay, realizes that he is trans and starts to transition. I don't want to go too heavily into the plot of this one, but I will give trigger warnings for peers and parents just not getting it. There was definitely a lot of misgendering that happened in this book, so if that is something that triggers you, tread lightly with that. What I really liked about this narrative is it went from Jay not at all understanding what was going to need to happen to transition to finding out about it and going through all of those emotions and then also trying to live life outside of this big issue. I thought my neighbor was done weed whacking and now they're doing it again so if you can hear that, sorry it's gonna happen. Chris Beam is not trans herself, but I believe has two close family members who are under the trans umbrella and has written a number of nonfiction books about the trans experience, so she definitely did her homework going into creating this YA novel. The third book I finished this week has a story behind it. On Friday, I realized that there was a drag show happening really close to me and I decided that I wanted to go to it. However, they'd sold out all the pre-sales, so I had to get there early to get tickets, which meant a lot of sitting around and waiting for the show to happen. It was at a local bar, so like, I could get a drink, but I am absolutely terrible at socializing with strangers I don't know. Maybe if I had a friend there who wasn't one of the people working behind the bar, I would have been able to get into some conversations, but that's just not who I am as a person. We should know this by now. So instead of trying to talk to the scary, scary humans, I found a seat with my beer, opened up my phone, and started reading this arc. And because the show operated on drag time and started 25 minutes later than it should have, and had a like half hour intermission, I got through almost half of Going Off Script by Jen Wilde. I'm a really big Jen Wilde fan. Queens of Geek made me cry during one of the book tubeathons. I adore The Brightsiders, which came out last year. She actually drew the logo for my channel. So obviously I was very excited for this book and it did not disappoint. This book is about 18 year old Bex who grew up just outside of Seattle, Washington and has just arrived in LA to be an intern on her favorite TV show. Long term goal, she wants to be a show writer than a show runner and maybe one day end up running the place. Her cousin, who's three years older and she actually grew up with, now lives in LA and he's a makeup artist, so she moves in with him and starts this internship. And she means to tell him immediately upon getting there that she's gay. She knows that he will be fine with this, he is also a queer AF. But there's this whole family history of her following him around, and she doesn't want people in her family to just assume that she's saying she's gay because he's gay. So this is a coming out story, it's a story about working in television, and it's also a story of queer characters being erased. She writes a spec script for one of the episodes, and the showrunner ends up stealing it, which is dirty on his part, but at least the show is going to get another queer character. Or so she thinks. I absolutely tore through this. Like I said, I read half of it at a drag show, which I felt was just so on theme. And then I quickly finished it the next morning after waking up from said drag show. This one comes out on May 21st, so get excited and start pre-ordering. Speaking of drag shows, I also finished season 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race. I was happy with all of the queens that were at the top. I was fine with how many queens went to the finale. All of that was fine. What I was not fine with, and I won't actually spoil this with names or anything, so you will only understand these details if you've seen the finale. In the finale, there was a point where there was supposed to be an elimination and there wasn't, and I feel like that was only done because the final song that they were lip syncing to had three people 
people who wrote it or performed it or whatever originally. So I feel like the only reason for bringing that third person forward was that. And the thing is that person should not have been brought forward. The other person clearly out lip synced them and to bring them forward just because the final song was sung by three people originally is really suspect to me. Which of course ended up in that person who should have been eliminated winning and I was just like, mm, no friend, it should have been one of the other two. So that's how I feel about that crowding. Speaking of crowns, I also watched the first episode of the most recent season of Game of Thrones, and I will not spoil anything here, but one thing I will say is I really like that thing in TV and movies where characters who you know because you've been watching it meet for the first time, or haven't seen each other in forever, and then that look they give each other the first time they see each other. That is my favorite thing that might happen in this episode. Also, I would have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that my friend who owns an armory actually rented some of his stuff out to this episode specifically, so at least one of those swords, I was like, I'm pretty sure that belongs to Ripley. And onto the thing you know I watch every week, I watch the most recent episode of Survivor, and I also finished the 18th season of Survivor. I wasn't mad about how season 18 ended, but I was kind of mad that the other person didn't get any jury votes. That was sad to me. And as for season 38, there was a pretty significant elimination, so we'll see how that goes. Onto what I listened to this week. First, I listened to Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. If you have the ability, definitely listen to this book rather than read it. This book is done in interview format, so it reads a lot like doing one of those VH1 behind the scenes type of things about a band. And I didn't know that going in, I just knew that people said you should listen to the audiobook if you can. So that's what I did. But while I was listening to it, I actually flipped through a copy of it at work to just see what it looked like on the page, and I can see why people would have a problem with trying to read it in that format. We are used to reading things in paragraphs, with descriptions and setting points and that type of thing, and essentially this is a book that is all dialogue. Which is good, it really really works, and it really worked for the format of what this book was supposed to be. But if you think of yourself as somebody who's thrown off by a different type of format on the page, this is definitely one to listen to because it is full cast, so you're getting a different voice with all of these different characters, and there are a lot of them. Also, occasionally the voices will remind you who they are, which is very important because there are a lot of band members, there are a lot of people outside of the band. This book chronicles the artistic lives of Daisy Jones, who is a solo artist, and The Six, who is a band that started out with just two brothers, and then got bigger, and then their keyboardist was a girl, so they couldn't be called the Dunn Brothers anymore, so there were six of them. They're the six. This book is written as a biography of the band as a whole, and I really enjoyed the way it was done. The format fits perfectly for what type of story this was. And I feel all along that this was meant to be an audiobook, it was meant to be something that was listened to, especially because it is about music. I know not everybody has access to the audiobook, although if you have a local public library, check out their digital services because you never know. And not everybody has the ability to listen to audiobooks. But I feel like the audiobook definitely enriches the experience of the narrative. It is still something that you can read on the page. In fact, I'm tempted to pick it up and just kind of look at it and see how far I would get if that's how I started out the book. What I love most about it is because of the format it's written in, she has this challenge of how to build these scenes and build up all this tension with just people's dialogue. And because of that, I thought it was a work of art. The other audiobook I listened to this week was I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. This was actually an unfinished manuscript that was kind of cobbled together after her passing. Michelle McNamara was a crime writer and she was specifically interested in the Golden State Killer, or at least that's what she dubbed him. This was a person operating out of California who raped and killed many, many people. If I'm remembering correctly, he raped at least 50 people and killed at least 10. And this book was a combination of her notes on the case, different interviews she did with different law enforcement agents or people who were connected to any of the cases, and articles she had written about this case. It turned out that shortly after she passed, they've actually caught the killer. And there's a whole podcast about it, as well as an HBO special about it, which I haven't consumed yet, but I'm considering doing. I feel like since the scope of this case was so wide, it was hard to put into one narrative. And because the manuscript was unfinished, there were obviously points that were a little bit disjointed, but they were pointed out in the book by the editor as sections that were put together based on her notes as opposed to something she had completely written. Michelle McNamara always said that she doesn't really care if she is the person that figures out who he is, she just wants him behind bars. And I'm just happy for her and her family and the victims and the families of all the victims that that finally happened. At least I think that he was convicted. I haven't actually checked yet, but I know that a suspect was apprehended. 
That's it for this week. If you've read, watched, or listened to any of these, let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye!